My name is Sima Sabah and I'm a computer vision researcher. I've been working in the field for the past 10 years and I still get excited every time I hear about a new cool idea. This is exactly what happened when I first heard about flow-based generative models, which apparently have been around for a while, but most people I know haven't heard about them. The purpose of this talk is to change that and get you to appreciate them as much as I do. We will start the talk by presenting the problem deep image generators are facing. Then we will go over the main idea of each of the three main families of image generators and we'll finish by a comparison between them. Deep image generators can be seen as artists. During training, they use many images to learn a model, let's call it G. And in inference, they start with random canvases and use G to generate images that looks like the one they have seen in training. So what does this G function learning? Well, ideally, we would like it to learn the probability P to generate an image X from the distribution of our training images. This way we can just sample P and generate realistic images. The problem is that computing this probability is really hard. It requires going over all of the canvases in the world, which is not very practical. Each type of image generator has a different approach to handle this issue. All image generators are trained to be artists. The difference is in the teaching method. Let's start with generative adversarial networks with a tough, uncompromising teacher. GANs have two competing components. The first is the generator, which is like the artist we have seen before trying to generate images of cats. His adversary, the discriminator, is like an art critic. He has a bunch of real images of cats, and given two images, he needs to determine which one is real and which one was generated by the artist. In the beginning, the artist doesn't really know how to draw a cat, so it's pretty easy for the discriminator to learn what is a real image. This requires the generator to learn and train until it produces something that looks like a cat. Now the discriminator has to work harder to decide, but once it learns, it raises the bar again for the generator. This goes on until the generator becomes so good that the discriminator can no longer tell the difference. If we formalize this, our artist is a learn network G that produces an image given a random input Z, and our art critic is another learn network D that, given two images, classifies them as real or fake. And this is being optimized with a minimax on the classification loss. This means that the generator and discriminator have opposite objectives and they take turns training. When D is being trained, G is being fixed and we minimize the classification error. And when G is being trained, D is being fixed and we maximize the classification error. And in inference, we no longer need the discriminator, we just randomly sample Z and given the generator, we generate an image X. Next, we have variational autoencoders with a cool teacher. Variational autoencoders also have two components, only this time they work together. We start with an image X and use an encoder to encode it into a latent space, which is the probability to generate Z given an input image X, usually modeled as a Gaussian, from which we can sample a specific Z and use a decoder to decode it into another image X tag, which hopefully looks like the one we started with. This is being optimized with a lower bound on the probability of x that we wanted to optimize. This allows us to write the objective as two terms, a reconstruction loss. We basically want our decoded image to be as similar as possible to the input image, just like with other autoencoders. And the second term is a regularization term. We want our latent space to be as close as possible to be normally distributed, meaning having a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. So why would we even want to regularize the space? Well, let's say we didn't. If we look at the visualization of the latent space, it would look something like that. Every training image would be encoded to a colorful blob in the latent space. And if we sample from this blob, we will get an image that looks like this training image. The thing is that we don't really have this visualization in inference. We don't know where all of our training images were encoded to and we might sample from somewhere in the middle. And in this case, we will just generate a random image, which is not a desirable quality in a generative model. What happens when we regularize the space is that we basically push all of these distributions to be together around the normal distribution. So now our latent space is much more complete, 
And if we randomly sample from the normal distribution, we are much more likely to generate a valid image. This order also allows us to do some other cool tricks. So let's say we want to interpolate between the triangle and the circle. What we can do is use the encoder to encode them into the latent space, interpolate between them in the latent space, and now we can use the decoder on different points on this interpolation line to generate new images that interpolate between the triangle and the circle in the image space. Pretty cool, huh? So in training, we basically train our encoder and decoder together, and in inference, we only use the decoder, randomly sample Z, and generate new images with the decoder. The last family we're going to talk about are flow-based generative models with a didactic professor. The architecture of flow-based models resembles the one of variational autoencoders, but it has some fundamental changes. So we still have an image X that is being encoded into a latent space C that is normally distributed and decoded back to another image X tag. Only now we call our encoder a flow and it implements a function F and our decoder is the inverse flow that implements the exact inverse function. This means that we don't really need to learn the decoder. It's enough to train a single network during training, which is our flow, and in inference, we can just invert this learned function to generate new images. The other change is that because this is an invertible function, z has to be in the exact same dimension as x, and not in a lower dimension like we usually use in autoencoders. So schematically speaking, we will look more like that. Z is in the same dimension of X, only normally distributed. And those changes allow us to directly optimize the probability of real data, which is our holy grail. So let's dive in to understand what is flow and how it is useful in a generative model. So a flow or a normalizing flow is a probabilistic tool that takes X from a complex distribution and maps it into z from a simpler distribution using an invertible function, so we can also go back from z to x. And we can use the mapping between x and z to write the probability of x that is hard to compute as a function of the probability of z, which is easier to compute. If we follow the change of variable rule, we get this expression that has two parts. The first is the probability of z which is our simpler distribution. And this is where the magic happens. This is where we decide what we want the distribution of our latent space to be. We usually choose a normal distribution, but we could have chosen uniform, Gaussian, or whatever we can evaluate during training. The second part is a scaling factor. All it does is making sure that this expression is still a valid probability distribution and sums into one. Mathematically speaking, this is the determinant of the Jacobian matrix of this transformation, but although it looks scary, it's just a single number that normalizes this distribution. So what are the requirements from this transform function for it to be useful in the generative model? Well, first of all, we want the determinant of the Jacobian to be easy to compute because this is what we optimize during training, and if it is slow to compute, our training will be slow as well. Secondly, we need it to be easily invertible. In the generative model, we need to generate x from z, so we need to use the inverse function. The thing is that in our generative model, the probability of x is the distribution of our training images, and we know how complex this is. And what are the chances that we can find a single function that will map this very complex distribution to a normal one and still hold these conditions? It is much more likely that our training will be very slow. And this is where we use the last piece of normalizing flows. A flow is not a single function. It is actually a composition of functions that gradually transforms the complex distribution into a simple one, one function at a time. And the nice thing about composition is that the inverse function is actually a composition of each of the inverse functions. So we can use simpler functions that hold these conditions. The flow would hold them as well. But the fact that we are composing uh, functions will generate the complex distribution that we need. So if you put it all back in our generative model, we learn one network, which is a flow, and the composition of function transforms in the neural network world to different blocks being stacked together. Each is easily invertible with easy to compute Jacobian determinant. 
And during training, we directly optimize the probability of X using this expression. In inference, we use the inverse flow to either reconstruct X from Z, or just randomly sample Z from a normal distribution to generate new images. So, the inverse flow is basically the inverse blocks being stacked together. So now that we've learned about the three main families of generative models, why should you use flow-based models? First of all, quality-wise, they generate amazing images. It's the same high quality that we're used to from GANs that are known for their high quality images, and much better than a typical variational autoencoder that tends to generate blurry images. There are a few recent papers of uh, variational autoencoders that are able to generate high resolution images, but this is much harder to do with this method and requires a lot of engineering. Optimization wise, we already know that flows optimize our holy grail, which is the probability of real data, while VAEs approximate it using a reconstruction and regularization term that has a trade-off between each other. GANs optimize minimax on the classification loss. The optimum solution for this optimization is being reached in Nash equilibrium, which is very unstable. One example of why this can be tricky is what happens if the discriminator is being trained too quickly. This way, no matter what the generator will try to do, it will keep getting the same feedback, that it's not good enough. And this is not productive. Without some good feedback, it can never learn what a good image looks like and it will never converge. If we look at the probability estimations, flow estimated exactly a while VA is approximated. GANs don't explicitly try to model the distribution, but they are able to generate images from it. We can look at it as if they're implicitly learning a subset of this distribution. In extreme cases, this subset may only be a single image, so maybe they can generate one cat perfectly, but they will keep generating the same cat. And this is being referred to as mod collapse. Reversibility-wise, meaning if you want to generate a specific image, if we have a mapping between X and our latent space Z, we can just take our image, map it to our latent space, and we know what is the Z we need to use in order to reconstruct this image exactly or approximately. But with GANs, we don't have this mapping. This means we will have to search the whole space of Z to try to find the Z that will generate this image, and it is not guaranteed that we will find it because we only learn a subset of this distribution. If we look at the latent space, latent space of both flows and VAEs is normally distributed. And this usually allows us to change a single attribute and interpolate on it in the latent space and generate these nice videos that you see here. While this is not guaranteed, it is much more likely and easier to obtain with this method than with GANs. Having said that, there are quite a few recent papers on GANs that are able to disentangle the features in the latent space, but it is much harder to do with GANs and requires a lot of engineering. So let's review the teachers we have seen. First, we talked about generative adversarial networks with a tough, uncompromising teacher. It doesn't give much guidance, only whether the final result is good enough or not, but it does push its students to be the very best and generate amazing art. However, not all students can handle the pressure, so not all of them become artists. The variational autoencoder teacher is the cool teacher. He teaches the students to do the job, but doesn't push them to be the very best. Instead, he teaches them how to do some cool tricks if they want to. His students will not generate the best art, but still be decent artists and will be more famous for the extra capabilities that they have. The flow-based teacher is the didactic professor. If you follow his instructions and do your homework, you are guaranteed to generate amazing art, but you are required to put in the work. So which one will you choose? Feel free to reach out and tell me what you think. If you want to learn more, check out these links or just invite me to give the full talk. Thank you for your time.